I can be pretty clumsy. And I've always been that way. I was pretty clumsy as a kid. And I would trip over my feet. That was like, I don't know how I would do that. Um, there wouldn't be anything in my way, but somehow I would find a way to stumble. And I assume it's because when I was born, my legs were sort of turned out a little bit, so I had to wear this brace, particularly to help straighten out my right leg. So um, I don't have pictures of me, actually, in those braces, but um, there is a picture that you can see. It is these shoes, right? You would have the, like, the shoes, and it had the, the hard bottom and this brace in between so that you would help straighten out your feet when you're an infant, when I was learning to crawl and to walk. And it helped me out a little bit, but not completely. So when I got a little bit older, even in my clumsiness, my mom signed me up for ballet. And it did not work out very well. I was there for maybe one or two years, but I was not very elegant or graceful, so that did not work out very well for me either. And then when I got a little bit older as a teenager, she enrolled me in something called a cotillion. Now, if you don't know what a cotillion is, a cotillion is the sort of height of upper-class black society. My neighbor was a part of this exclusive organization. It's sort of a, um, a coming out for teenage girls. And you go to the stands, you have to take dance lessons and etiquette classes. Again, this is in my mom's effort to make me a little less clumsy, to keep me from stumbling so much. Thankfully, I never had to do that again. I did it one time and that was it. But it was part of her mission. And my mother's goal um, with the bars and with the ballet and later with the cotillion was to keep me as I grew older from literally stumbling as I walked through life. Today, we'll see that Jesus also wants to keep us from stumbling. And not stumbling over cracks in the pavement, but stumbling in our walk that could lead to unhealthy desires. He wants to prevent us from stumbling to keep us from falling into the pain and destruction of sin. Specifically, Jesus is talking about adultery. Why would Jesus be concer so concerned about adultery? Because it's so prevalent in our society, both then and now. Did you know that one third of pastors have admitted to committing adultery? adultery. And adultery is dangerous. We know this, right? Because it, it destroys families. It inflicts the deepest level of pain on one of the most intimate of relationships, that between a husband and a wife. It is usually the, in the top two or three reasons why marriages fail. Adultery breaks the covenant not only between uh, one spouse, but also with God. It's so important to God that it is listed in the top 10 commandments, right? Specifically, it is in the 10 commandments, not the top 10, in the 10 commandments. Specifically, number seven. And honestly, when one commits adultery, one violates a number of commandments, putting something else before God, not to lie, and depending on who the person is, not coveting your neighbor's spouse. It is possible but it can be extremely difficult to rebuild after infidelity, particularly repeated infidelity. Trust has been broken. There remains a lingering question of commitment to the spouse and the marriage. There is a loss of respect and possibly a loss of love as well. Next week's sermon is going to talk a little bit more about adultery and divorce. I don't want to talk too much about it, but suffice it to say it's important to God. And now that we're here and we're talking about this, I want to acknowledge those who may have been affected by adultery in any way, either as the offender or the victim or maybe the child involved in the marriage or maybe the product of that affair. I can only imagine what you have been through, and my prayer is that God has healed and will continue to heal your heart and bring restoration. Now, if you're single like me, this does not mean that you get to tune out of this sermon or put it in your back pocket for some other time that may or may not come. Because as we'll see in the text this morning, God's definition of adultery includes more than just those who are married. So if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're looking at verses 27 through 30. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. And it reads, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. 
But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. As we've been learning in the past few weeks in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching about righteousness. And he talks about the crowd and us, and as he tells the crowd and us, that our righteousness must surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees. So he wants us to understand the difference. There is the letter of the law, what the law actually says with little or no interpretation, and then there's the spirit of the law. That is what is behind the law. What's the purpose of the law? In focusing on the spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law, we saw last week that Jesus focuses not just on murder, right, but on anger. Jesus wants to look beyond the rules to the principles which should govern the conduct of God's people. This is important to understand because you're not going to find a rule in the Bible for every question that you might have. But if you come to understand God's character, and God's heart, and his principles, and his purposes, you can make wise decisions with the help of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is showing us this in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus contrasts how God's laws were practiced, this external legalism, with his more demanding ethic focused on an inward righteousness. Jesus is teaching on adultery. First, In Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, he states the law. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. The focus was on the physical act. Then he gives his interpretation in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. This is the right and deeper interpretation and use of the law. Jesus addresses men because he's speaking to an audience of men, not like how we are today. But believe me, the teaching applies to women as well. The physical act of adultery is the result of a lustful heart, a longing or an unmet desire of the heart. Jesus, therefore, is focused on the inward state of the heart. The physical act is just the manifestation of it. Jesus is calling us to a higher righteousness. And this is a righteousness that goes beyond the outward observance, what other people can see, to what is actually going on in the heart, whether the act is ever performed or not. This is the inside righteousness that we have been speaking about for the past few weeks. Under Jesus' definition, more of us are guilty than are not. Under Jesus' definition, it actually doesn't matter if you're married or not. The issue is less about marriage and more about what resides in your heart. Adultery had been previously considered to be only sexual relations between a married person and someone other than his or her spouse. But by speaking of lust, Jesus expands the conversation to include not just married men, but married women. And not just married people, but singles as well. Why? Because we all struggle with lust, women and men, married or single. It is a condition of the heart, not a condition of marriage. You don't have to be married to be an adulterer. You don't have to have never committed adultery to be an adulterer. Is anyone getting a little hot? We may think we are righteous because we've never actually committed murder like we talked about last week. Or we've never actually performed the act of adultery. But Jesus says no. The outside of the cup is clean, but what about the inside? What is going on in your heart? But the point is not to shame us, but rather out of his love to keep us from stumbling over lust that could lead to a fall. So Jesus gives us the law. 
he gives us his interpretation, and then he provides the remedy. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. Remove that which causes the lust. And finally, Jesus provides the warning. He says, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Hell is the final place of judgment. Jesus says that eternal judgment is the punishment for failing to heed his words. Sin that is left undealt with will lead to judgment. Now, of course, one can be forgiven, certainly by God and hopefully by one's spouse, but there is... Costs, there are costs to sin and consequences like the scars that remain. And so Jesus wants to, us to avoid this pain in ourselves and in others by dealing with the issue of lust when we stumble before we actually fall. Lust is beyond the natural desires of attraction but the deliberate and repeated filling of one's mind with fantasies that would be evil if acted out. This is important because sometimes in church we can make people feel like sexual desire is wrong, and that's not true. Sexual desire is from God. But it's the misplacing of that desire or its consumption of us that is sinful. That is lust. So when Jesus says that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart, Jesus is not talking about the passing glance or or just attraction. The look that Jesus is talking about is both actual and metaphorical. It is the constant looking. The look that breeds an intentional and conscious misplaced desire. It is a desire to feed the inner appetite as a substitute for or perhaps the beginning of the act of adultery. Jesus is not saying that you should live your whole life with your eyes looking down so as to avoid anybody who might attract you, be attractive to you. That's not the case at all. What he is saying is that when that look turns into lingering, and misplaced desire, then there's a a problem. Ladies, unfortunately, we know all too well what that look looks like, what it feels like, don't we? It's that gaze that lingers just a little bit too long. Sometimes the countenance of a man's face changes. Sometimes his demeanor changes. It's that look that says, I'm enjoying what I'm seeing a little bit too much. It is the most uncomfortable feeling. Sometimes you don't always see it, like maybe your back is turned, but you always feel it. It's frightening, and it's uncomfortable, and it's violating and demeaning. You don't actually know if the person is going to act on that look or not. And yes, men can experience this as well. And so whether it's a, it's a man or it's a woman, it's wrong and it is demeaning. It is fear-inducing. This is what Jesus is talking about. He is condemning the lustful thoughts and actions that follow a lingering gaze. He is condemning thinking about that person long after they are gone, after they are gone, not because they're so godly and holy, but because of a sexual desire with, that burns within you. He's condemning a yearning that overpowers your ability to do the right thing. Jesus wants us to focus on our hearts as much as we focus on the act itself. And look at what Jesus does. He places the responsibility for the lust on the person doing the lusting. Jesus is not concerned by what you claim the other person did to entice you. Jesus will deal with him or her on his own. Here, Jesus is clear that women are not responsible for enticing men into bad action. You are responsible for where your eyes linger. You are responsible for the thoughts you have late at night. You are responsible for your own lust. And yes, Jesus and Paul will address not causing someone else to stumble. But Jesus also makes clear that you are responsible for the condition of your eyes and your heart. 
remove your gaze. Gouge out your eyes if it causes you to stumble. Don't police women's bodies or their clothing. Now, I'm not picking on men, but I'm saying this because too often women are blamed for men's bad behavior. It's as if men are just sort of like walking hormones or animals, right? That they can't control themselves. And we know that's not true. I know that's not true, brothers, right? But it is so important that we come to understand this for ourselves and for our children, both our daughters and our sons. This past week, we experienced the murder of eight people in Atlanta, six of whom were Asian women. My heart breaks for them and their families and and for all of my Asian brothers and sisters. These were women who worked in massage parlors and the murderer, and he has confessed, confessed to it, told officers that he did this because of his own sex addiction. He would patronize massage parlors and say they contributed to his struggle. But those women are not responsible for how he fed his own addiction. We live in a world where Asian women are fetishized for their exotic looks. That fetish does not belong to them. It belongs to the men who have learned to objectify and dehumanize women and have not learned to handle their own lust. But to be clear, lust is not just a man's issue. Remember the story of Potiphar's wife? She tried to seduce Joseph and was pretty bold about it. She grabbed him by the cloak and told him, come to bed with me. Lust affects us all and can truly lead to destruction if not dealt with. And contrary to what we might think or feel, it resides in our heart. It is an outgrowth of our heart. This is why Jesus is concerned with the condition of our hearts. This is why there can be emotional temptations as much as physical ones. Now, while you may think that lust is purely personal and doesn't hurt anyone when not acted upon, Jesus says otherwise. It dishonors the person one is lusting after and it disregards God. The lusting of one's heart is equivalent to the physical act of adultery. When we lust after a person, we objectify them. They become a use for us rather than a person. We have stripped them of the imago Dei, the image of God in them, and have made them just a thing or an object. And when someone becomes an object, there's no room to love them because you only want to satisfy your own need. There is no love, no compassion, only utility. What can I get from this person? You want to possess that person and dominate that person for them to say what you want them to say and do what you want them to do. That's not relationship or love. That's objectification and utility. And not only do we objectify a person when we lust after them, but we make that person an idol. If a person begins to dominate your thoughts in an unhealthy way and sinful manner and you can't stop or you won't stop, you have placed that person above God. And I'm not talking about when you're madly in love with someone, right? And you just can't get them off of your mind. I'm talking about when your thoughts are sexual in desire and overwhelm you to a point that you won't stop or you feel you can't stop. You are placing this desire above God. And that is idolatry. Jesus has provided the answer, though. So how can we keep from stumbling into lust? As Pastor Peter preached last week about the issue of anger, Jesus is telling us to deal drastically with the sin, so drastically as necessary to avoid sinning in the future. Sin, if allowed in, will strive to master us. It will strive to dominate us and overtake us. Our goal, therefore, is eradication. Jesus wants us to deal immediately and decisively with lust. So the first way Jesus gives us to deal with lust is to examine yourself thoroughly. Examine yourself thoroughly. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, Jesus says, if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. And then in verse 30, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. 
You'll need to do an inventory of yourself to determine what causes you to stumble. Maybe it's your eye. Maybe it's your hand. Maybe it's a particular person. Maybe it's a particular activity. Or maybe it's a particular time of year. Have you ever noticed that when the weather shifts and it starts to get cold, all of a sudden people need to hook up? When we were in college, we used to call this warm body syndrome. Because it didn't matter who the person was, you just wanted to be next to a warm body. Right? So maybe it's a particular time of year. Maybe it's been in this pandemic. Maybe you're lonely and isolated. Where have you turned? Has it been to pornography? Have you spent way too much time scrolling and, and fantasizing about women or men online? Whatever it is, you have to examine yourself. This is why rules are not always great. I can say with certainty that you should not watch pornography, but pornography may not be what makes you stumble. I have no interest in pornography whatsoever, never have. I can recognize God's beauty in a man, but physical attraction does not cause me to lust. I am attracted to how a man makes me feel. And if I'm not careful, I can be, begin fantasizing about or lusting about a man, not because of how he looks, but about how he made me feel. I don't need visual boundaries. I need emotional boundaries. I don't have very deep emotional conversations with too many men as a result of this. I try to remain professional at all times. And some people think I'm a little standoffish, but those are the boundaries that I know are necessary for me. So take some time to examine yourself. And not just the surface stuff, but really examine your heart. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? It's usually more than just this woman is beautiful or this man is hot. What is happening in your heart? Are you more, are you more vulnerable when your spouse is out of town or when there's tension in your marriage? Perhaps the real reason is loneliness or insecurity. Does that one coworker, even over Zoom, make you giggle a little bit too much? Or you, you know, dress differently or put on a little makeup when you know that person's going to be on, online? Maybe you feel unloved or unappreciated. Where does your mind go when you're lonely or stressed or tired? Are there holes in your marriage or in your life that you are trying to fill? Do you feel unwanted or angry or afraid? Think back to the times in your past when you, not, when you haven't quite done things God's way and look for the patterns in your life. Take the time to identify those thoughts and actions which before they ever materialize into something physical can make temptation more likely. And ask the Lord to help reveal these things to you. Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24, gives us the words to pray. David says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Take that prayer seriously and ask God to help you examine yourself. And examine yourself with your soulmate or with a trusted friend. Open up and share about past relationships or how you're struggling with lust. Lust grows in secret and it is hard to overcome on your own. You will begin to rationalize it to yourself. Oh, it's just a fantasy. Oh, at least I'm not actually engaging in the physical act. It's just pictures. It's just a look. By sharing your struggle with the right godly person, you shed light on it and it allows the grace of God to step in. They can help you identify what's really going on and how to address those things. And once we're aware of those things, Jesus tells us what else we can do. So first we examine ourselves and second, we must remove the root cause early. Remove the root cause early. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, Jesus says, If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. He says, It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And there are two aspects here, to remove the things that cause you to stumble and to do it early. 
Jesus wants to prevent us from falling. That means we have to remove the stumbling block as soon as we recognize it and do it from the root. If the entry for lust is your eyes, remove the eye. Now, of course, Jesus does not literally mean for us to, to, to remove our eye, but he does want us to remove from ourselves anyone or anything that causes us to stumble and to sin. He wants us to cut it off from the root. Think of King David and how different his life would have been if he had removed the root from his life. While the army was at war, David was home and eventually made his way to the roof and he watched Bathsheba bathe. It was in watching her bathe that he developed this lust for her that ultimately led to having her sent to him, having an affair with her, and led to him eventually killing her husband, Uriah. How could things have been different for David? Well, some believe he should have been at war to begin with, so maybe he should have just been doing his job. But more importantly, David should not have been watching a woman bathe. Once he realized that she was within his sight, he should have removed himself. If he knew that this was her regular bathing time, don't go there when she's bathing. The same is true for us as well. If you realize through your examination of yourself that you visit certain channels and websites late at night, put a block on them. Or if reading certain books causes you to lust, throw them out. This is where trusted confidants or soulmates can really help you in addition to removing things you may need to set up boundaries and develop strategies to deal with underlying emotional issues. Maybe it's better for you to have a roommate than for you to live alone. Maybe you need to delete social media accounts. Maybe you need to admit to yourself that that person is not just a harmless friend. Maybe you need to take a break from dating and reset yourself because it always seems to go too far. Ask yourself, what do I need to do to remove the stumbling blocks from my life? But that's just behavioral. Removal also means dealing with the underlying issues. Our very real emotions can manifest themselves in so many different ways. If you are watching pornography to escape trouble in your marriage or your own feelings of loneliness or insecurity, unless you deal with those root issues, you may put a block on your TV, but you'll just find something else. Focus on the challenges in your marriage. Focus on your loneliness. Focus on your insecurity or your anger or your fear. Many times, lust is a search for intimacy. Maybe intimacy has been lost with your spouse. For us singles, it can be a little tricky for us, right? Because the desire for intimacy seems to have, like, no place for it to go. But lust actually takes away intimacy. For married people, it separates you and your spouse. Instead of your energy focused on your marriage, it's focused on the television, or it's focused on the movies, or it's focused on the other person, the emotional connection with them. For singles, we run the risk of developing unhealthy habits that will later make it hard for us to really develop intimacy in a real relationship. And for all of us, married and single, lust separates us from God. We miss out on benefiting from true intimacy with our Father and the true lover of our souls. Only love leads to intimacy with God and others. Unless we focus on what's really going on in our hearts, behavioral changes won't last and we'll actually end up sabotaging ourselves. Now, the second aspect of this removal process is to do it early. Do it as soon as you recognize it, even if it's something small. Jesus cautions us that it is better to lose one part of the body than for the whole body to go to hell. It's like an amputation. Oftentimes, the disease area starts small, like maybe a toe. But if it's not removed immediately, when it's small and seemingly minor, it can spread and travel up the leg. So what was once a toe amputation is now, you know, below the knee or right above the knee. Remove the diseased area before it can spread to the entire body. Think back to King David again. If he had averted his gaze or left the roof, 
he would have saved himself, not just from being an adulterer, but from being a murderer too. What started off as something I believe he thought was just so small in his eyes led to an affair, a pregnancy, and a murder. We can't wait until it grows. We won't be able to control it then. We have to deal with sin when it begins, as soon as we recognize it. How many married people have told their spouses that they didn't mean for adultery to happen? How many have said is that it started out so innocently? And for most people, I think they're actually telling the truth the way they understand it to be. They didn't intend an affair. They didn't intend feelings to grow. They didn't intend a relationship to develop or a child to be born. They just wanted a meal. They just had a few conversations. They just innocently flirted at the coffee shop. What started off as a small eye ended up infecting the entire body. This is how sin works. It's never going to remain a little sin. It's always wants all of you. It takes and it takes and it takes. Even when you don't intend it to happen, this is why we must be vigilant. Once you've identified what's going on, get the help you need immediately. That might mean marriage counseling or having an honest conversation with your spouse. It might mean going back and reading over soul care. It might mean meeting with a pastor or a counselor. Whatever it is, don't hesitate. And finally, to keep from stumbling into sin, we must pursue the eternal urgently. Pursue the eternal urgently. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus says, It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. The loss or gain is eternal. Jesus recognizes that there is pain involved with removing sin. As righteous as we'd like to think we are, we have to admit that we enjoy sin. If we didn't, we wouldn't do it. We have to deal with the fact that we wrestle with this and we have to grieve what it means to let go of it. But we also need to remember the cost of that sin. The pleasure is temporary. The pain of removal is temporary. But the effects are eternal. Left unchecked, Lust could eventually destroy us. It can ruin your marriage. It can ruin your career and reputation. Think of all the pastors and, and politicians that we've seen having to, having to deal with this. We're watching Andrew, Andrew Cuomo go through it right now. It can ruin your witness as Christians. Even single people, it affects your ability to be in a healthy relationship. It breeds selfishness because you are only out for self-gratification. It clouds your judgment in choosing a partner. And these are just some of the earthly things, right? Jesus is actually talking really more about the eternal. Jesus wants us to know how urgent this is. So he says to gouge out your eye or, or cut off your hand if these things cause you to stumble. Do whatever you have to do to free yourself. Jesus' words may seem harsh, but it's because the cost is so great. This is not something that can wait. Jesus was intentional with his words. In that day, the right eye and the right hand were considered more valuable. Jesus knew what he was saying and the impact that he would have. No matter how high the cost, we must be willing to take urgent and decisive measures to protect our hearts and our lives and those we love. Jesus is telling us that what seems like self-denial is actually really gain. The denial of temporary pleasure is greater than destroying your marriage. It's better than destroying your life. Jesus is asking us to operate in wisdom. He is causing, he's calling us to, to sacrifice the lesser for the greater. Not because he wants to be mean to us, but because he loves us. Remember, the pain is temporary, but the gain is eternal. To allow lust to grow is to expose your whole life to the corruption of sin. 
Lust never remains just in your mind or in the physical act. The effects spill out in ways you can't even imagine. I've never been married and I've never dated a married man, so I can't speak about that. But I can speak about being involved in emotional relationships with the wrong person or crossing sexual boundaries in dating. I fell in love with being loved, even if it was by the wrong person. I succumbed to sexual desires for the need for intimacy. But the sin of lust was never confined to my head or to a, six, or to a particular act. It affected my relationship with God. I noticed over time that I was unable to connect with God, right? There's that distance that comes in there. Praying was harder. Reading my Bible was harder. Worshiping was harder. And once you're in it, removal is that much harder. Correcting the situation is much more difficult. This is why Jesus implores us to be vigilant about it before it gets to that point. He loves us enough to want to prevent us from stumbling. It's not always easy, but if we are able to examine ourselves and actively remove the root causes and, and pursue the eternal over the temporary, we will experience the joy and intimacy of a relationship with God that is beyond compare. Will you commit to doing the work, even the painful work, for the sake of your relationship with God? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we know that the topic of lust is difficult, and it is hard, God. And we understand that you understand that. And so, God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would give all of us courage, that you would give all of us your wisdom, that you would unsettle all of us in our hearts, that we would not remain comfortable in our sin. God, I pray for marriages that are on the brink. I pray for spouses who are wrestling with this, that God, that you might cover them and bring them to wholeness through honesty and examination and removing those stumbling blocks and bringing them to you to seek after the eternal. God, I pray for my single brothers and sisters who are trying to figure out how to navigate all of this. God, I pray for honest conversations with you and with one another that we would deal with what's really going on in our hearts, that the changes wouldn't just be behavioral, Lord God, but that would lead to true freedom. God, I thank you that you love us enough, that you want us to keep us from stumbling, and more importantly, from falling. It is through your son, Jesus Christ's name, that we pray. Amen. As you know, when we complete the sermon, it's not just stopping here. We want to offer you some next steps. And so if you would, if you have your communication card on your app, you can take it out. If you're looking at it online, you can join us there. Number one, I want to experience the peace of Christ through a relationship with him. If you have never made a commitment to Jesus Christ and God is tugging on your heart and you want to do that today, whether you're in person or online, check that box. We are happy to pray for you. We are happy to talk to you and help you understand what it means to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. So check that box and we are happy to talk with you. Number two, I am struggling with lust and I would like to speak with a pastor. Let me say something to you. Do not be ashamed. Let me say something to you. We are not here to judge you because we all wrestle with something. And so if this is you, I invite you to be courageous. Check the box and we will be in touch with you. Number three, I will take time to examine myself with God and a trusted friend this week. Do the work. If you know this is you, start doing some of that work. Start shaking up the ground a little bit. 
so that you can get back on the right track. Number four, please sign me up for the Women and Men in Leadership Seminar. It's this Friday at 7 p.m. We are excited about the speaker. Her name is Barbara Edinger. She is wonderful. If you ever see her name on anything, go to it. So I, men and women, I invite you to join us on Friday at 7 p.m. Number five, please sign me up for Sacred Space next Sunday at 1.30 p.m. We are hosting this conversation, and I'm so glad that God put us on our, on our hearts to do this because this, we have been planning this for a while, and it's so necessary. So I invite you to check that box. We'll send you the link so that you can join us. And as a sidebar, um, if you look online on Metro Connect, I will be giving a closing prayer at a prayer vigil in Tenafly today at 3 p.m. if you would like to join us. It is a prayer vigil honoring, memorializing um, what happened this week. And number six, please sign me up for premarital classes. If you are married, engaged, thinking, excuse me, if you are married, excuse me, if you are engaged or thinking about being engaged, please sign up for the premarital classes. Thank you so much. God bless you, Metro.